Donald W. Kemp, born in, on a farm near Jessup, Iowa. I was born June 5th, 1920. I am 91 years old. I was 1940, they had the draft, and so my draft number come up. I chose to go to the Navy rather than the Army or Marines. And I joined the, the Navy in August of 1941. Went through boot camp at Great Lakes, had six months of boot camp. 90% of our company, which was 400 and some people, were assigned to the U.S. Hornet, which was not yet in commission. We went aboard the Hornet in October of 1941. They'd aboard the ship until it was sunk in 1942 of August 26th. Because many of the people aboard the ship, including the officers, were, you might say, recruits. So we had to be all trained. Shake what they call shakedown crews to get, including the pilots, and landing and taking off the ship. I think we were down there for six weeks. Come back to Norfolk, Virginia. Short time there, we they bought two B-25s to the dock and put them aboard our ship. We went out into the Chesapeake Bay to see whether they could be launched without crashing. We came back in, which you don't use high speed when you're in the bay or in the harbor. So somehow a German submarine followed us in through the safety net it's supposed to keep submarines out of the bay area, which our captain really maneuvered the ship. Airplanes above watching finally spotted the sub and sank it. Shortly after the first year, we started heading around to the west coast. We first talked at San Diego to take out some Marine pilots so they could practice carrier landing. And then we finally headed to Frisco where we picked up Doodle's plane in the first part of April. I think it was the second week. And then that's when we started he heading towards Tokyo. Well, we was at California, so we just kept going north towards Alaska which is a route that the Japanese apparently didn't pay attention to because they didn't think any of our ships were up there. Thought we were going to transport these planes someplace, which after two days out, they let us know we were going to launch them at Japan. And we were supposed to go in one more day before we launched them which if we probably did, we probably would have never got back because they spotted some crawlers out there which were probably fishing ships, but also they had communication they picked up, so they were sank very quick. You didn't, we didn't actually see them ourselves because they were far enough away that ocean that rough, well, you wouldn't see them little buggers. Lucky the pilots even saw them flying off of the Enterprise, and that was their job, and scouting all the time. And then when they had passed the word in, they had orders if they could make it to the land, they had to be launched, and that's what happened. Yes, we had very rough sea, very high winds. At least three days it was, they were not able to set up and cook. They made sandwiches, and they did, were able to keep some of the coffee pots going. <laughs> it was really rough, because they couldn't set tables up, because the ship was rolling too much, they just fold up. 
Well, they call them ground swells. You, the ocean opens up. It's not like the Atlantic or any other ocean. That the waves are more choppy, and the Pacific has a wide ground swells. They just open up, and you fall right into them. They can get very high, which they were hitting 32 feet, which is the height of the ship. Destroyers were not able to stay with us, so all we had was cruisers and one other carrier with us. An engine in about the fourth, fifth plane back, and there was no way we had a crane aboard ship, but it would not reach it. So they had to make a tripod out of four by eights. We always had lumber aboard ship for many reasons. And so they made a tripod and we had a chain hoist that they used, which uh, with the ship rolling and stuff, it was a very hard and tedious job. And of course, they had people help them keep that tripod in place, but it all worked out eventually. It took a while. Last plane to take off, which we had them playing the wheels right on the end of the flight deck, which we had to have the room to get them all aboard. And so we hit a very big ground squall, which tipped way forward, and many of us kind of lost our balance and hanging on the plane, because it naturally was trying to tip backwards. And shipmate by the name of Wall was next to me, and somehow he lost balance, and the prop hit him. I thought it hit him in the back, but it took his left arm off completely. What she was very lucky that he was able to get him down to sick bay in a hurry, which they got the blood stopped. And he was transferred a couple of days later to the hospital ship. He married the nurse that took care of him in a hospital ship. We took a collection up for Wall and he also, our flight deck commanding officer, got him a lifetime job which his brother run the Ryan Aircraft Factory in San Diego. Well, we had rain all the time and of course new ropes. We had many to keep that big airplane tied down and keep moving around. So we had to keep loosening those ropes because they keep swelling. If you didn't loosen them, they would crack the wing and pull it off. So it was a 24-hour a day job. Many people working all the time. Who took care of the airplanes all the time? The Army personnel, which they had aboard, which were different technicians for their radar and their gunnery and communications and mechanics to repair anything. That, it was strictly an Army program. We were just transferring the people. You said you saw Doolittle every day? Quite a few days. He was always up the board, walking around, looking things over. Very quiet person. Probably had too much on his mind to stop and talk to people. Um, if, if he did, he would be swarmed. <laughs> well, there was a bunch of medals they had. I don't know where they came from or why. But they tied them on to some bombs before they put them in the bomb deck, send them back to Japan. I don't know how anybody ever thought that anybody would ever see them, because if that bomb went off, they'd be flying everywhere. But it was just a, one of those things people like to do. Well, each plane carried five five-gallon cans of gasoline for extra fuel. Had pumps hooked up to pump it into the tanks when needed, if they had a chance to do it. So well, Doolittle was the first airplane off, yes? Right. And everybody thought he didn't make it at first? Well, he, when he went off, the plane went right down into one of the ground walls, so he was, he was right on the water as long as we could see. Staying above the waves, that was about it. Yeah. So it took him a long time to get up in the air. He made it fly that long and using full of horsepower all the time and burned a lot of fuel, too. So you were actually able to see the planes taking off, huh? Oh, yeah. We watched them all. <laughs> you were kind of famous for painting the white line down the aircraft carrier. 
I see two white lines. Well, the one guided the nose wheel, and the other one was to keep the outside wheel on that line, <laughs> so they'd stay centered and taken off. Very short runway for a big airplane. You know, a lot of times out to sea, you have a hard time getting 30 knots. You got to almost have 30 knots launch airplanes or to land them. Cause you got to have wind. You know, land too hard and pull the landing gear, which is not too strong to start with. I worked with the landing signal officer, which is my job was to see that the tail hook was down and the flaps were down and you could hear the pilot when he changed the pitch of the prop, which he had to do the land. So I was standing back to the landing officer and if none of this was happening, I'd tell him to wave it off. So we had a very tedious job because the pilots always seemed to want to come over close to us. And of course, we had to watch to jump out of the way if they got too close, because the wings would hit us. We had a net to drop in, which happened quite a bit. Everybody was fire crew, but no gunners. They were all trained people. We were right next to them all the time. It was attacked. We were the one ship they picked out to sink. Once they started in, well, there were too many of them to we all shot down, and we had three guys that just died right into the ship, the suicide pilots. That was their assignment, and of course, them guys caused a lot of trouble. They went right down through the stack, two of them, so that went right down through the middle of the ship. They tried to tow, but it didn't work. Broke the anchor chain right in two. Okay. Well, they were trying to move it, whatever they could do. Oh, we never made it back to Hawaii. Destroyer stayed. In fact, I was the only destroyer that stayed to sink it. We saw, I think, six or eight torpedoes into it, so that took it pretty much to go down then. Of course, there were still people aboard yet. Well, because there were people trapped that couldn't get out of there. All the forward magazine where they had bombs and all that stuff, those people were all trapped. They had a escape tunnel that goes from the bottom of the ship to the top, and that was hit by a bomb, so it was shut off, so nobody could get out of there. So that was a bad deal. It was a very hard day in the water, because there was high altitude bombers up there, dropping 100-pound bombs, which got a, quite a few people, because you had to try to keep your rear end out of the water, because it would blow your guts out if you didn't. If you weren't bent over as much as you could, that concussion would go right through you. If it happened to be a bomb real close to you, I'm sure it got a lot of people. And of course there were sharks out there too, but they were not very hungry because we had thrown a lot of people overboard. I'd say we probably lost 600 that day. So after Doolittle took off, you guys turned around and headed back to Hawaii as fast as you could, yes? Well, we started out, but we uh, didn't get very far, and we started to go south. They found out that they're going to have the attack at Midway, and that happened June 5th on my birthday when, when uh, that attack started. We launched all our planes that morning, and we never got a plane back that day. The ones that, well, we lost Torpedo 8 Squadron, the complete squadron, all but one guy. And nobody knows why he didn't get killed. But Ensign Gay, he survived out of 15 airplanes and three people in each airplane. And uh, there were a lot of our planes ended up in the drink and the rest of them did land on Midway. So we didn't have any airplanes. <laughs> it was a bad day again. And the Yorktown got sunk that day with an aircraft carrier. So the first part of the war, we were pretty busy all the time. <laughs> Just no. Well, then after Midway, then we went down south, stayed down there. We was the only aircraft carrier in operation then, so we were awful busy. And finally the WASS has got repaired and joined up with us, and we was right on the equator at that time. We were 
stayed on top of the equator for many weeks back and forth. And how long were you in Hawaii? Well, off and on, but you only couldn't go over for a couple hours. It wasn't really worth because uh, you had to catch the bus the time you got over there and you had to be sure to catch the bus back because you had only two hours, so you had to be back on time. Otherwise, you're in trouble. Better off to just stay there because the time you got over there, you had to turn around and come back. And of course, you had to carry gas masks too, and that was a pain in the butt. You stayed aboard ship, you didn't spend time on the base. You never knew when that you were going to take off. Being out there every day, you just, uh, and you're busy. Always have something to do. Well, we painted it camouflage. Okay. Made it look like waves. Well, you know, that true submarine talk. You know, if they come up to get a look at the ship with the waves. Hell of a job to paint that thing. And of course, <laughs> you know, when you was hanging over the side painting the thing, of course, that was when you was in dock someplace. And they're supposed to have all the toilets shut off, and every once in a while they'd forget one. You were painting there, boom, somebody used the damn toilet, so you'd get all crap all over you. Start of the war, you know, you had to scrape the bottom of that ship every time you come in and dock. You know, they put you in dry dock, and you'd have to scrape it. Barnacles on there, of course. They grow, so then you had to keep it clean because otherwise uh, it takes a lot of speed of the ship away. You have to have a slick bottom. So then after the war got, well, like the Prince, Princeton, we didn't have to scrape that because they, they thought the ship needed it. Why you come in dry dock and they had a crew at the shipyard that sandblast the thing. They could do it in a few hours when you used to take couple days for us guys. So you're in there real quick and out. And they do a better job. Much better. Guy Miller, he was a Navy guy? Yeah. He trained uh, new little pilots. In the area they trained with short runways. And you said Miller wanted to go along on the run? Oh yeah. Wasn't allowed. Strictly an army operation. We were just helping them. Transporting them. Very calm, and you know, he was a different person. You know, he was a boxer and a stunt pilot and all that stuff. You know, he was. Then, of course, like them older pilots like him, you know, they. You have all kinds of equipment that they fly by the seat of their pants, tell them what, how that airplane's working. And, you know, if they spent so many hours in them things, mm -hmm. it makes a lot of difference. Very, very calm fella. Did a lot for the service. And, well, all them guys did. Of course, we met a lot of these pilots later on. We had them come to our ship reunion. Very good bunch. I think there's a few of them left yet. The last two are supposed to drink the two bottles of wine they got. How they got two bottles of wine or the last two alive are supposed to take care of those. And one, he was a navigator aboard. He uh, was a prisoner of war over there for a few years. Guy that was his head guard, mean son of a gun. And so this fellow after the war, he went to a uh, school to be a minister. So he went back over to Japan and spent 30 years over there. And in fact, he met this bad guard and converted him to his religion. Well, he really, really a talker. In fact, at the one meeting, they finally had to shut him off because he had talked for a half hour already. You know, he had a lot of stories to tell. Many, many stories. Uh, that was one bad thing that we should have, but I guess nobody even thought about it. We should have always had a recorder going at these meetings. Do you guys still have meetings? Well, they try to, but hell, they only, 
I think the last one that they had last year, I think there were only four people there. They're trying to have one this year in either Branson or Wisconsin. We still have our newsletters. A couple times a year. We used to have it every two or three months, but not anymore. Well, because we don't have any money. <laughs> I think the last I heard the Hornet had 200 people that are still paying, and most of those are unable to attend.